Hello, everybody. This is our first seminar for this fall and for this semester. I hope to see you around more and keep tuned about our news on our website website and also on the channels and email list that you see our previous announcement. And we are proudly uh, having uh, Professor Pandit to introduce our today's speakers. And I will uh, say to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to our CS IP seminar. So this is our the, the, uh, the first test IP seminar this semester. Uh, I'm very happy to see all of you. And today we have Professor Alice Wong uh, from UT Austin uh, to come here to give us a let's say a very interesting topic. Let's say talk on this like a uh, uh, sparsity in a large language model or large models, right? So, and uh, uh, Professor Wang is now a uh, senior associate professor at uh, University of uh, Texas, Austin. And uh, he also holds the uh, uh, Temple Foundation uh, Indo Faculty Fellowship, right? You don't have it. You don't have it. You don't <laughs> yeah, have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I forget the number. I know there's a number, but this is. I figure out you, you work hard to, to, to read this, but you have to. <laughs> okay, so. And, and uh, Professor Wang also holds a position at, uh, as a director of AI research at uh, Peach Hard, right? Is, uh, is that you remember this wrong, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So let's welcome um, Professor Wang. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm glad that you gave up the introduction already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Pan, and uh, thank you for having me here. And I've been thinking to Georgia Tech multiple times because uh, I really like Georgia Tech. Okay. Well, among, among many reasons, Georgia Tech has hired some of my best friends, which uh, is a good, uh, uh, which make uh, make me many good reasons to come back and visit different of them. So today, I'm uh, trying. To, I, I will introduce our recent work. So. I put a large language model in the title I give 10 because I figured out that this will be a buzzword that more people will come. I put a sparsity there because this is a true thing I'm going to talk about. And uh, I don't really understand a large language model. I can only <laughs> tell you a bit about the sparsity. So let's get started. All right. So with this audience, I guess the, this is the year 2023. I really don't have to explain anybody. AI models are huge. Okay. So many parameters, and we talk about large language models, and we're talking about the billions. And yesterday, I just see someone who announced a trend uh, 180 billion parameter model in the open source and too scaled. I don't even want to download that to my server. <laughs> but in any case, okay, big models, high dimensional non convex optimization, if we like to call that. So those models create a lot of practical pressure. We should compress them. Okay. What are the compression methods? So, <clears throat> Kelly, what, is, what are the compression methods? <laughs> Quantization. Pruning, quantization, knowledge displacement. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. I only understand one of them called pruning. <laughs> All right. So, a model of method, pruning is perhaps close to my heart because I, like many people sitting here, I grew up from signal processing background, and much of my PhD, uh, PhD research is about compressing L1 minimization, gradient descent, uh, project <laughs> gradient descent. And suddenly, up to a certain part of the year, I realized I cannot publish anything into the conferences with those topics. So what I can do? Okay, I do sparse optimization. So I figure out that uh, I will just uh, do what I know the best in the age of deep neural network. I will do something called a sparse neural network. So sparse neural network, originally known as pruning, actually has a very profound meanings in the, 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 the profound meanings. Not just pruning. When we talk about pruning, we're saying that uh, yet you are model already trained. We should uh, remove those unimportant parameters and keep those important ones to make model whole performance up almost the same. We can also, for example, prune the model before it has been fully trained, like a half baked, half way of training. We call pruning wire training. We can also do the pure network that is sparse from the initialization and then train the network from scratch in a sparse way. This is called pruning before initialization. And if you work in the sparse, if you work in the efficient ML field, you probably also heard a buzzword such as lottery tickets hypothesis, okay, such as a mixture of expert, Google like it. Those are all different forms of sparsity, and I call them collectively sparse neural networks. So in today's talk, I will mainly talk about the sparse network by denoting the weight sparsity. That is most of the weight in the network being zero. This is a one big but non-exclusive class of sparse neural network. There are also sparse neural network whose activations are zero. 
which are more interesting for inference acceleration. We can also do sparse neural network whose gradient is there, uh, uh, mostly there, which can help us do incremental training. But today we'll mostly talk about the sparsified weight. This is a field that uh, many people start to pay interest in and public and a lot of uh, mostly useless paper has been published. <laughs> For example, starting from the years when the IceNet and ResNet transformer being published, we can see that as the model getting bigger, we see a synchronized between when the model, the specification method also get better, also get more. And uh, to be honest, I up to year 2023, it has already come to a point. I, I feel fed up reading the pruning papers in those main conferences. I like all your pruning papers. <laughs> <laughs> right. But because they are too fancy, okay, too many new things, and too many new things whose result I cannot reproduce. <laughs> so I just don't quite like it. When you talk about spark, anyone who researches sparsity should be a believer of the philosophy we call Occam's Razak, right? What is that is? Yeah, um, we will not invent anything more complicated unless absolutely necessary. I will stay with simple things. And this is my philosophy as well. So I will use this sparse philosophy to look at the sparsity research itself to see what we can do with the simple things. All right. So today I will ask a question, start from here. As our model getting larger, play is compressing them, and uh, be particular today, is, is sparsifying their weights. Becoming easier or harder? Which of us? What do you think? Guess. What do you think? Make a guess. Um, How's the coin? Easier. Easier? Why? Because you have um you have more uh room for I guess not error per se, but like more options to like to um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, just again, because I got a billion parameters, and probably there are, okay, so many of them are just being there, right? Being redundant and being useless, okay? That's your guess, right? Yeah. Better money on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I can provide a counter argument. I have a billion model because I'm also training a billion level corpus. I have a lot of training data, and I need to eat all those data in my weights. And because and nowadays, large language models are also capable of, uh, similarly capable of doing everything. A lot of the capabilities are encapsulated in one model. So now ask, tell me again, do you think compressing them will be easier or harder? Harder. It's kind of harder. Okay. <laughs> okay, good, good. good. This is the type of flexibility we need in research. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm glad about that because either way you are not calling me the right answer. So today I will talk about two parts. The first part is yes, it's easier. The second part is no, it's easier. <laughs> okay, that will be what I can tell you today. Okay? <laughs> You cannot win money from it. <laughs> All right. So disclaimer before I start talking about things. So okay. So like I said, like I implied in my contract, like in, in, in my abstract, in my, in my abstract, my whole point of the talk is to tell you that I'm not going to contradict myself. <laughs> okay. Hope I can convince you. <laughs> so before I start, two disclaimers. Two disclaimers because I don't know whether there are hardware people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would, put, I would say that I'm stuck in the hardware people. Okay, okay clever hardware people sitting here. So two things I will, two things I make a disclaimer. First one, as I say, my personal philosophy is all comes right up. I want to only use simple things unless absolutely necessary. No. So this talk from end to end will not invent any new algorithm. I hate inventing new algorithm. I read many new algorithms that simply don't work. So I will only tell you something you already know, and hopefully using those tools to tell you something you didn't know yet. That's the first thing. No new algorithm in this talk. Second, I will be mostly talking about something hardware people hate most called unstructured sparsity. <laughs> I'm using that as an unstructured sparsity is defined as I'm zeroing out the element mostly just by their magnitude, and I don't care where zeros are. And if you have a common sense in hardware acceleration, those are basically useless for GPU acceleration, mm -hmm. unless your sparsity level is very high, right? But you can't do FPGA. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. yeah. <laughs> but we, so first, unstru I am a very active defender of unstructured sparsity as an algorithm people. I even wrote an article with called a short handbook for sparse neural network researchers and dedicatedly wrote a section to convince this field. Do not, if you are my review too next time, 
don't ask me why I'm doing unstructured sparsity. And so I'm actually using this in this area's neurons because again, have a paper review to ask me why you're studying unstructured sparsity. So I'm happily tell that, go check this page, go check this one, which in some authority in this field wrote this, go check this online resource, go to question 3.5, and this is exactly every word I want to tell you. <laughs> so save my word in your rebuttal. But to long story short, in this, in, this, uh, in this talk, I was mostly talking about unstructured sparsity because I'm not viewing pruning here as a hardware acceleration. I'm viewing this as a sparse optimization. I want to reduce the element in a continuous way as much possible and by magnitude. And uh, also, unstructured sparsity is, uh, is so far the best in preserving the accuracy if I don't care about the hardware. And although most times I will be talking about the toy unstructured sparsity, I will, I promise at a certain point, I will tell you how those results translate to your favorite structural sparsity. Just give me time. Okay. With all the preparation, see, I'm very cautious about setting your expectation. <laughs> With those disclaimers, I'll enter the first part. Okay, first author is the setting over there. Uh, so the, the, the first part of the work with essential sparsity, emergence of essential sparsity, and uh, I will make my first argument. Those models are easier to compress. All right, before I come to something new, let's start from something old, old fashioned. What do we know about pruning in neural network? I say, I, I in general don't like talking about pruning. I like to talk about soft neural network because it's more profound and broader. But let's talk about pruning as a concrete example. Starting from the red neural network, I will train that into a pre-trained dense version. Prefer me well, ImageNet? Good. And then I will choose some criteria to decide the importance of those connection weights, maybe magnitude, maybe back normal, whatsoever, important scores. And uh, that will reduce my connection to a sparse connected graph. And then I get this graph, but uh, that will inevitable be some performance loss after removing those connections. And even when you believe they are all important, you will lose something. So you will retrain that by keeping this sparse connectivity graph. That means zero or forever zero, non-zero, you can change that value. And uh, usually, when, when you try to make the best performance, you don't do that once. You don't do that multiple times. You repeat, you, you, you retry and get a performance and further specify the connection in this graph and get a sparse network, repeat and retry again, repeat until you achieve the sparsity you want and the performance restored. This is usually called iterative pruning. And uh, if the criterion here to select unimportant edges to be the weight magnitude, this is called iterative, mag iterative magnitude pruning, or short for IMP. Well, simple as it sounds, this algorithm remains as one of the most robust performers in pruning. So see, simple things work. But let me ask you another thing, okay? If I start from a random network and uh, do something to directly prove from the scratch and then continue train from scratch using this sparse neural network, what would you guess? Would you succeed in general? No, no. Okay. <laughs> before I will, uh, before I pour it all things. <laughs> so this is sparse neural network. We train that. It's in general not trainable. And the reason is not hard to comprehend. Deep neural network are in general, in general struggles with gradient, gradient vanishing. And if I have removed many of those edges, then I'm adding a lot of zeros to the chain of back propagation, and more likely my gradient will die somewhere, right? Much less effective passes. So this algorithm has uh, so this the, so and, and more rugged landscape. So many empirical works to study here, and this is training from scratch. And if I not do training from scratch, but instead training instead from a pre-trained model, which, which is more relevant to what today we're talking about. From this pre-trained model, we will also do the same routine. Prune, retrain, prune, retrain. The only difference is uh, just that we don't have this initial process, but start looking at this point. This one may be a pre-trained nerve, a pre-trained vision transformer, or whatsoever. But the usually the practice is we still prune, retrain, and do that iterate. Okay, <laughs> and some of our early work actually explored that scenario. For example, we have a paper in New York 20 called the pre-trained lottery tickets in bird. And it's perhaps the first to discover that you can apply the same IMP routine in an official bird checkpoint 
And you will be able to specify bird without damaging its universal transferability. So instead of, uh, in this case, simple case, you are training this on ImageNet, you can actually apply the same routine on the pre-training data set of a pre-trained model, say BERT, and then specify BERT to, without damaging its transfer learning to glue or squat, if you can, okay? So this is a landscape of old-fashioned sparsity. Long story short, I will use iterative training and iterative training and every round of iterative, there will be a retraining step to restore the accuracy. Nothing fancy, right? Next. So this is good if you are dealing with a ResNet. Experimental scales continue to explode, as we all know, right? Like uh, a few months earlier, my student told me something I was really doubting, saying that uh, my, one of my students told me that uh, I want to do a small scale proof of experiment. What is a small scale proof of experiment? ResNet 50 on ImageNet. A small scale proof of, proof of concept. Okay, so nowadays the scale is definitely different from what I know before. So this is not just a joke. Consider what I have discovered on last what we have discovered on our last page. If this model continues to scale up, that means I need to do the retraining of the gigantic model multiple times in order to specify why we want to specify a model. That's because we want to reduce its inference cost. But in order to reduce its inference cost. I need to pay, pay five times, 10 times, depending on how many times iterative you run it, pay five times higher the training cost. This is, in general, not a bad deal if the inference model can be reused many times, but not if the training cost itself is absolutely formidable. For example, think of, don't think of this as a small experiment such as a ResNet ImageNet. <laughs> think about something real big, GPT. Okay, you probably all heard that uh, GPT people realize that their training data contains some bug, but they cannot afford, even they know there is some problem, they cannot retrain it because retraining GPT is even beyond the open AI's code. Mm. Okay, and uh, we are speaking as poor academics. <laughs> <laughs> so I, in general, hate the idea that uh, to in order to compress or prune or specify future big models, I have to first retrain them. I absolutely hate retraining. I want to get rid of it. So we propose a bold idea called essential sparsity, which is actually very simple. So the mathematically involved version is written here. This is coined by my student sitting here, but anyone really want to read this? Okay, if no one kills this, skip this part. I have a plan language version for you. <laughs> so we define essential sparsity as the following concept. Okay, you can totally ignore this part. I just put it uh, to show my respect. Okay. <laughs> so the essential sparsity is defined as such a special sparsity ratio range. There are two defining clauses. Number one, within this sparsity range, one short pruning without the iterative, Without retraining, we are meant we preserve the same performance as the unpruned dense network. This is my statement one. And because this network is generally viewed as the empirical upper bound of any prune method, we also claim as well as any other fancy pruning method. Okay, we assume there exists a red. Here I'm talking about assumption. I haven't proved, but take my assumption. Okay, assumption one. Assumption two, beyond this range, means sparsity exceeding certain threshold, you will observe a very sharp dropping point with a large slope on the fine tuning performance. That means when you fine tune this one shot pruned without a retraining model, the performance starts to permanently loss without luck to get back. So this is essential sparsity. We conjecture there is a warm period that any pruning is only as good. So pruning is so easy. So such that any fancy pruning does not perform better than a simple pruning. And another branch, all pruning method will actually fail. And uh, anyone has any question about my definition here? Is that implied, I'm so sorry. Is that implied that kind of the simple pruning would have the same effect on the big models 
as well as fancy poems? I will tell you this uh, roughly about uh, 18 pages. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so I All have right, a question. People are still following and without objection, I will go next. Next part, I will show you experimental evidences. So before, oh, before that, so we have, we declare that essential sparsity is a widely observable inductive bias in large language models and pre-trained VITs, only if they are large enough. When I say large enough, I'm talking about a sub-billion level, billion level, and the 10 billion level parameter. You cannot observe that in ResNet, mobile net, or any small scale experiment. In those models, we universally observe that a significant proportion of the weight could can be weight can be re just removed by magnitude. Data free, which means I don't need to see any pre-training or fine-tuning or calibration data. And the training free, which means I don't do retraining to restore the use. Just remove the this is my pruning algorithm. Okay. Uh, remark one. So I don't like fancy things. I say. Remark one. Why I like magnitude-based pruning. First, this is very natural because I could uh, pre-sort all elements of a pre-trained model before actually deploying them. And then generating sparse mass is as easy as reading an index table of the weight so of the weight sort. More than that, the and, and this mask structure is agnostic to downstream applications. You don't need to predict what data was the downstream task if that what I said is true. You just read the mask by magnitude order and get any sparsity you want. No overhead. You just need to do one sorting of pre trained model. Remark two, any sparse mask obtained in this way is naturally nested within a lower sparsity mask. So that means if I, my downstream application need to switch between different sparsity due to resource or whatever other constraint, I don't need to store even multiple sparse masks with me. I just need to store one sorting table and every sparse mask is nested within others whose sparsity, whose non-zero element is more than it, right? Everybody is nested from 99% to 1%. They are nested with each other because they are sampled from the one sorting order, right? So downstream agnostic and nested. And those properties actually would mean a lot if you want to do adaptive survey of large language model in the downstream. And without showing result today, this is actually something we are working on right now, how to do adaptive influence of large language model. But not today, just uh, I'm telling you why this is uh, appealing. So let's start from the performance of large language models. Okay, I actually didn't start from any large language model, only 1.3 billion. It's called a small large language model. <laughs> All right, so we have tried the third base OPD 100 for 25 million, one OPD this million, and OPD 1.3 million. Later on, I will show you some names you are more familiar with. And we test on different downstream tasks over there at each of the VC4 models. I want to point out something. To, uh, the two things to you. Number one, you probably see some weird things that you don't expect. Before we observe, so okay, so this every in, in, in every plot, you will see this uh, this horizontal line, which is all shows the dense model performance. X axis is the sparsity ratio. And why is the task a specific performance? Okay. So one thing you probably didn't, didn't expect is in almost all the tasks, you can first see the pruned down large language model to behave a little bit better, not worse, not the same, a little bit better than the large language model unpruned, which may go against your intuition if you believe this model is absolute selling of performance. Okay, so this is, however, not totally surprising to us because we have many prior works showing that sparsity is a helper for generalization, especially in future cases. We have both theoretical and empirical work to show that sparse deep networks in a range generalize better. And empirically, you can understand us 
Sparsity, well, well, if you ha you are happy with LoRa or other practically efficient tuning algorithms, you should you shouldn't be surprised that sparsity actually works well when you don't have a lot of data in the downstream because that constraints is a parameter you could change, and when you have too many parameters to change, half our regularization will help you rather than hurt you if your data is not enough. Okay, and also in many of the, in many cases with the data, the real data contains certain noise. Sparsity is also a noise robust regularizer. We have other uh, work to show that. So that's how we understand this. Because any downstream data is relatively few short compared to the pre-training corpus, and any real data contain noise besides the true signal we want. So we consider a moderate amount of sparsity to help generalization. That's why you almost always observe this range, more or less. A little bit of sparsity will help uh, the, the large language model transfer better, but a very moderate sparsity. For example, as moderate, like in some of the cases, as moderate as 10%, usually 10 to 20% are our safe range to see how. But this is a counterintuitive phenomenon, but not my main story. So if we overcome this counterintuition, now main story. You can see in all those cases, you are seeing. The, the let's check the two behaviors I just assumed. Check the cross point of those uh, of those prune accuracy curve with this absolute dense model curve. You find the crossing point, and we gen in general you observe that before you crossing this curve, you basically see flat, saturated, similar performance with the dense and the moderately better, right? <laughs> and after you crossing this point, the performance start to drop very quickly, and you see the two phases behaving, right? And if you think, of, well, if you first think about it, it shouldn't be very, very surprising to you because you can generally feel, okay, so there are some redundancy in the weight. I remove them, remove, remove. Some like the two, when you first start to remove it, uh, well, it doesn't hurt my performance, when you move too much, it starts to drop quickly, okay? So I don't want to feel this is a very surprising. Although I will hope to bring you more surprise in the next few pages. Just uh, this universally exists, regardless of uh, using whatever model, a dense saturation period and a faster dropping period. The two phase, the phase transition of the sparse group. Okay. And of course, another thing I should mention that is if you notice different tasks, all the six figures here denote a different downstream task on NLP. All those different tasks. You are seeing the crossing point is uh, often very different. And uh, in fact, we find uh, the smallest, the, if the model is small, its essential sparsity tuning point where it will cross the dense line become more unpredictable. For example, the smallest model here, OBT, which have only 125 million parameters, <laughs> you can see that the crossing point of this one, the blue line, actually vary a lot in different downstream tasks. Like in this one, this guy crosses roughly at 10%. This one, this guy has a larger fluctuations and across the, oh, sorry, it's not blue, it's green, sorry, sorry, the dark green one, okay? So the dark green one, you can see this one, it will cross pretty early here. And in this one, it dropped also very early here. This is another empirical observation we found. The smaller model has a more unstable behavior of this crossing. And often, in, if you continue to increase the model size, you cannot even observe this saturated flat period. It, you will just see drop. Only in large enough models, you see a stable behavior of first the fluctuating, a flat saturated, and then dropping. Okay, so model size is one prerequisite to observe this behavior. All right. And another thing I should mention is, you probably already noticed at the different tasks, the sparsity, essential sparsity, where we cross the dense curve, will vary. This is true. The, we observe that essential sparsity, although we say the selection of the sparse mask has nothing to do with the, the, with the task, actually, how much, how much sparsity you should select in order to maintain above the dense performance will be downstream dependent. So we have tried, for example, the same model per base and try when their performance will start to drop below the, their dense point, uh, dense point uh, on three different downstream tasks, uh, NWPS, SD, and SWAT. So all those three things, uh, so the task, all those three tasks, the 
you can consider the okay. So the task from from, from okay. So from the, the from the from the, from this one to this one to this one, the difficulty level of task in reasoning is monotonically decreasing. And then I think the result also makes sense to you. When you work on an easier task denoted by the yellow green, this has the highest essential sparsity, which means I could survive long in pruning until my ability is permanently damaged. And more difficult, you get less decreased. So one open question here we didn't fully know yet is how to predict the essential sparsity without regard to the downstream task. We don't have an analytical solution, but we have some ad hoc solution. Basically, we tested some existing task and basically find that for most of the for most of the downstream task, um, one two three billion for one two three billion pre-trained language models, it's safe to choose. 40, 45, or even 50. So 40 to 45 is a safe value. And if you do more complicated, more complicated with uh, means more multi-question answering and uh, like this one, nice, nice grade uh, reasoning, it will can take the, uh, so the, the essential sparsity can drop below uh, up to even 30%. 30% means 30% of zero, okay? So we are, this is an open core problem we're working on with some result. How to accurately estimate essential sparsity before I start training. So I don't have a mature answer for you now, but we should have an answer very soon. For now, I can just tell you, essential sparsity, the actual crossing point is downstream dependent, which is very understandable. And we also, besides large language model, we also tested on um, computer vision pre-trained models. Same behavior, and actually the behavior looks even more prominent. Saturate, drop, saturate, drop, and on all of them. We tried the VIT base. We tried another self-supervised pre-trained version, Dino VIT base. And there are several things I want you to know. So there are another important thing I want you to pay attention. Besides both the VIT base and the VIT large behavior behavior, it's more interesting to compare the VIT and the Dino here. So the Dino architecture here is also the same as the VIT base. The only difference between those two curves are VIT is a trend with internet classification loss and the Dino with a trend with a self-supervision law. And they are the same architecture, trend both on the image net, same data set. The only difference is the loss function. And we have observed in this example and many other similar examples that actually self-supervised model are more friendly to essential sparsity. Meaning a self-supervised pre-trained model could be pruned to a higher sparsity without damaging its downstream performance compare ImageNet. And I should remark that here, when I compare a supervised model and a self-supervised model, I'm not comparing their ImageNet performance. I'm comparing uh, their, the, their role as a pre-trained model to be transferred to a downstream dataset, such as a fine-grained image classification. So we find that in terms of transferability performance preservation, self-supervised model is more friendly for pruning. Okay, that's a side observation. So I know so far I have floated you with a lot of figures. So some of the take-home messages here as a summarize. So we find the existence of essential sparsity as we define two clauses in all vision and language models that we have so far tested. This is not a theoretically proven tool. I'm just telling you what I have observed so far. And it also holds for a wide range of model downstream tests, although the sharp tuning point where it takes place is a task that you can there. But it seems, I could add a mask to that. It seems to be somehow predictable now in our latest work, but not in this slide. And the sharpness behavior of the turning point behavior of essential sparsity is more profound in vision models than language models, and the self-supervised learning seems to be more friendly to sparsity than supervised learning. Those are the first batch of observations I want to you. Okay? Assuming no question, next batch of results. I haven't finished. So after I have observed the fine, we have observed the fine-tuning behaviors, we were very curious about the question. Sparsity seems to be, as I said, sparsity seems to be so prominent in pre-trained models everywhere. But we didn't initialize our model sparsity, right? How do you initialization? Timing initialization. So how sparsity, why I start from a dense Gaussian style initialization and end up with a sparse induced initially the model. How does the trans phase transition happen during the training process? Do they gradually specify? 
or do you observe a quick turning point somewhere that is critical for sparsity to emerge? This is our next question. So my student did another small scale experiment called the turning bird base 10 times from scratch. Okay, starting here. And here's I see every curve is averaged from uh, multiple rounds, and here are our results. So the training is under the training goals. Here should be the f of it's a type of, okay? This is a bird is a training, bird is training curve. And here on the y-axis, it's not the training error. It's the sparsity. Here, sparsity is computed by use a pre-selected threshold. We use a pretty aggressive threshold of uh, put, uh, the 10 power, the, uh, 10, 10 power negative six, very small one, okay? Basically digital precision. And see how many numbers of zero, digital sense two zeros, we could observe during the training process. And let me explain those curves. They are all bird-based, but we try to train bird-based using different amount of data. We want to see whether sparsity is a data-dependent property or not. Same architecture. So uh, you see, it started from this green curve, which is trained on the standard training set of bird-based. We grab the subsample to 90%, 80%, 70%, 60%, we didn't go further because it was started significantly under 50, okay? So we're roughly here. And you can see a very interesting behavior. As the data percentage, as I reduce the training data, we are flattening the curve, see? This is the original bird training, and which you observe. At some magical point during training, there is a sharp tuning point where the sparsity starts to drastically grow. I didn't do anything. I didn't even change the learning rate at this point. It just happened, okay? And I have a, I have the early paper actually observed the same called the early bird lottery chickens. So that paper of the reporting from the empirical perspective that sparsity in deep training seemed to experience a critical phase transition behavior. It happens suddenly. So I, I, can, I can talk this topic, topic for longer if you, anyone is of interest. It's very close to my heart. But back to this topic. Once we have a more, with, once we have enough data, there is a critical transition of sparsity. But if we don't fit this model enough data, sparsity actually does not happen that quickly. And I want to point to something you should feel counterintuitive about. Okay? Remember, this is the same. I'm giving you more data you see a jump in sparsity and eventually reach a higher sparsity. I'm giving you less data. The sparsity doesn't, the sparsity doesn't jump up and you end up with a lower sparsity. So in other words, I'm giving you more data. The model is more sparse eventually. How could this be correct? Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I don't know something, I will tease Richard. <laughs> yeah. It's, what? Uh, I guess learning to which weights are are more important. I, I guess I don't know. Adapting away from I wouldn't say away from the noise. But that's not true because I feel like there's there would be more noise in a larger data set. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, good. Flexible and submissible. I like it. Okay. All right. So I don't know the answer either. So don't be, don't, 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 don't. I'm just a flopping you. Although I have a hypothesis. So we, we call this new phenomenon as abrupt specification. And we find this to be a data centric phenomenon. More training data will, more training data will more prone to leading to abrupt specification. Sparsity comes out when you have enough data. And our hypothesis is we made a hypothesis we call knowledge condensation. And we hypothesis sparsity is a, sorry, password, emergent property in large language models. And that represents the large language model knows better how to abstract the commodity, reject the noise, and abstract the knowledge representation in more compact form. We consider this to be the emergence of abstraction. I always see sparsity as an abstraction process, okay? Separation between signal and noise. 
So I don't have a theory for that. I just really like it. And uh, we all, so, and eventually, we, we, we found the bird base and other models, when trained with more data, in general, tend to be more prunable as an end product. Okay, you hope you don't hate it. <laughs> All right, so there are some other results uh, talking about uh, different, uh, yeah, different downstream performances and how much that starts transfer. I'll skip the details, but uh, I hope I passed the main message. Okay, that's part two. I haven't finished <laughs> part three. Then we are so far we're claiming how essential sparsity happens. First part, how it happens in trans uh, during inference here actually means transport performance. Second, how it take place during the training dynamics. Third part, how it compares with the best pruning method we have. And here we select lottery tickets hypothesis. And my student did another small scale experiment <laughs> called a tiny lottery tickets from bird banks and the VIT banks. Okay, they did that. And uh, long story short, we have compared both NLP and computer vision case and find that when the model size is small, yes, lottery tickets seem to be better than our essential sparsity pruning, which is just a one shot, no proof, no retraining pruning. But when the performance scale passed the base scale, base gigantic or even larger billion level language models, we didn't find any statistical significant difference between the tedious lottery tickets mask and our one shot almost free mask. It's a side thing, okay? So the question here to the answer here to the question, how effective lottery ticket is within the essential sparsity range that does not create any fertility at the computation cost? The answer is no, but always when I say no, remember my prerequisite. I say no within the essential sparsity range, okay? I don't claim anything when we enter the second phase where we say the performance starts to sharp drop. I'm talking about the fluctuation range. Every pruning is only as good as magnitude pruning, okay? Don't take away my prerogative. And uh, we also compared the, the, the we also compared the sparse mask similarity using graph metrics, permutation environment. And I find that the essential spark, the one shot of sparse mask is surprisingly similar. Well, up to the 70, 80, 80, well, this is a 97, 98% similarity between the two masks. So really lottery tickets bring you almost the same thing as the chips, the cheapest thing. If you are number one, large enough model, number two, within the essential sparsity range. Okay. So, I have been talking a lot of those small models, which are only 100 million parameters. Now, billion level parameters, okay? Our observations scale up to billion level, 7 billion and uh, 16 billion. And we are now running experiment on 65 billion. So we have taken the, Kua's, the two Vekua models on the, on the latest MFAU benchmark. And we find that first thing is, indeed, on large language model, when we go to those really large ones after the uh, really large ones in order to maintain, and if people know this, MMU MU is tens of tests aggregated together. So when I say performance can match, that means the tens of tests performance all roughly the same. So this is a very high standard. And if I want to reach this high standard, I can, make, I can still observe essential sparsity within the range of uh, 30 to 35. If you compare with uh, one point something billion, that's one, one, between one to three billion, what we observe is usually 40, 45, 50 within this range. So this is lower a little bit. And, but still, within this range, our, pruning, our free pruning performs as well as the more expensive SOTA called the SPAS GPT, which is a Hazen based second optimization, second order optimization training, pruning and training approach. Okay. But this is uh, some, some second versus some hours comparison in cost. And beyond this point, so now let me give the, give you, so far I have been hiding the, hiding the discussion what happens beyond the essential sparsity range. Now let me show you. Beyond this essential sparsity range, we will observe that the best proven method will start to perform better than essential sparsity. Okay, here, left is essential sparsity, right is uh, the best proven method. You can observe that within this range, they are both preserving this performance. 
within this range, roughly between 70%, 75% and 60%, uh, roughly this range. Compared to this range, you can see sparse TBD confirmed apparently better than this is through, through a three point method, right? I don't want to hide that. But also, I want to, uh, want to point out that this in this range, the task performance itself has already started to deteriorate. So if you care about, uh, I want to have absolutely undamaged performance compared to the dense, you probably only care the first range. There will be a second range. The best pruning can perform better, but uh, both will start to sacrifice. And then there is a third range. When the sparsity is higher than the 65% magnitude, and so far the best pruning we have, they are equally bad. <laughs> that means there is an empirical setting any pruning method cannot overcome at this moment in the Vekua library building models. But we, if, if your boss asks you to generate a pruned model with a nearly the, well, absolutely the same performance with that, you should tell him that I was just the wrong magnitude based pruning, nothing further than that. Okay, so this is a full picture how it compares with the best pruning. And the last thing for hardware people, in we, find, we can eventually show essential sparsity also holds for thin structured patterns. N over M here, N equal to M equal four, the NVIDIA supported hardware sparsity. So on those two data set, we are, sorry, only a small model here, 35 million parameters. So the third model is here, the best pruning method. There is no sparsity issue because of two or four, you can only do 50% of sparsity. <laughs> so the 50% of sparsity is relatively heavy for large language model already. I can, uh, if you read all the recent papers, every pruning paper on large language model basically stop at 50%, I can tell you. Well, after 50%, performance start to trash. So here, structure 50% is a pretty challenging bug. That's why you will see the performance start to deteriorate in on both benchmarks, even using the best pruning method called sparse GPT. But within this range, you can find that struck in the structure of the 50%, the free pruning method still performs almost the same as the typical pruning method. So I'm in general arguing that this pruning, this free pruning method can go very far. And we are especially running more results in the N over M scenarios. We feel when our pruning problem become more constrained, such as N over M structure, this can actually, this free method seem to still hold a hope to compare with the, the worst. So, so the best, so why should I use best? <laughs> All right, so with that, I'm uh, completing my first part. Am I convincing you so far? Okay, now forget my first part, the second part. <laughs> Harder to compress. Okay, this is our uh, this is our idea paper, and uh, yeah, AJ is again sitting here. <laughs> All right, uh, I choose this title "Sparsity Cry" to show to. Uh, this is a sparse benchmark paper. I first want to highlight the name "Sparsity May Cry." Any people here know what is a devil may cry? PMC. Am I that old? <laughs> that is my favorite video game when I was in when I was in college. Okay, so I, I choose this name to pay tribute to my favorite video game. Okay, Sparsity May Cry. Let's fail Sparsity Neural Net together. And I wrote this paper. Okay, so this starts from uh, something I'm really pissed off when I reveal the recent Sparse papers. I asked my students to do a survey. 100 most recent accepted Sparse Neural Network paper will look at uh, what they do their experiment. Okay, I don't know whether they're your, your paper, sorry. Okay, okay. Among 100 papers, 79 are evaluating only a single task. 72 out of 79, that task is called image classification. <laughs> okay. And uh, among the uh, majority is on CIFA 10 and CIFA 100. ImageNet has a 62, and in image liter pruning literature, if you do ImageNet, people already say you're very responsible. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Small data. Okay. okay. And so it's almost a crime in year 2023 to still publish a pretty paper on MNI, so, so, and there are some people publish group, okay? We're not super happy with the evaluation, okay? Pruning, ImageNet itself discontinued in 2017 because people believe 
its performance has saturated. But it's cool. six years later, people are still pruning it. I feel it's a crime. So we, I asked my students, let's stop writing any paper on ImageNet. Let's build some benchmark ourselves. And that comes to this. So my students, uh, my students basically spend all the GPUs that they can beg from me <laughs> last summer to run all those experiments. So we choose four highly uncommon tasks and 10 highly tedious data sets. And they are correspondingly very large models. So some of the models used here, for example, here is a Roberta Large. We use, we use the in common sense reasoning is twice larger as a transformer XL, if you know what that means, okay? And uh, the task here we select are not a single step decision. They are reasoning tasks in common sense and arithmetic. In arithmetic, we have a data set from grade three to grade six to grade nine. And we also choose uh, AI for science applications. One of them pertains to stability prediction. It's a biochemical data set. And the last one is multilingual translation. We feel single tra single language translation for us is the same simple as the CIFA classification. So we go two to two, five, five, 10 to two, 10 to 10 multi-language translation and use all language performance at average. So those are our test tools. We have four tasks, four data sets, and some of the biggest model we can find. For example, here we're using ESM1B, which means one billion parameter. And all those things are either on some billion parameter or sub billion parameter. And on those data set, we have uh, played with uh, some of my favorite sparse algorithms. Lawrence is uh, post training pruning with magnitude, uh, random pruning, gradual magnitude pruning, RIGL, which is a standard way to do dynamic sparse training and pruning by initialization, like a random, random, random sparse mask or SNP, which is a very classical pruning of initialization. Okay, so this is a comprehensive representative console of pruning sparse algorithm before, during, and after training. Okay, with this console, so my students diligently run all those algorithms on those big models. Okay, okay those include the larger tickets. So you know how pissed I feel when I look at their GPU usage during the summer. <laughs> okay. Only to deliver one sentence message in the title. Nothing works. <laughs> I'm very happy. Okay, nothing works. <laughs> Uh, we have played with all those sparse algorithms, all those complicated things. Without going into all those close details, we find none of those tasks, and they are associated with huge models, can afford reasonably high pruning uh, sparsity levels. For some of the biggest models, those are close. Some of the biggest models, the sparsity level cannot even surpass 5% in order to maintain the dense performance, means, meaning they are extremely fragile. For some better ones, 20%, 30%, but no one will sustain beyond the 50% on this step. Adding pruning method. Okay? I'm so happy. That means like that means we, we if we want, we can write more papers. <laughs> All right. And some more con conclusions on this. Take home message. So on this range of tasks, we find the model prunability is intimately related to task difficulty. Difficult tasks will be more hard to, will be harder to prune, no surprise, right? And that's why SMC is so hard to prove all challenging tasks. Reasoning, algorithm, algebra, protein, yeah, those levels. Second, while we have seen success of pruning before the initialization and pruning during pruning before training and pruning during training, the early pruning, early training pruning method in standard image net experiments, none of those success, success seem to statistically significantly generalized to big model. That means pruning before initialization so far still doesn't work for large models. Third, the de facto pruning method, iterative magnitude pruning, doesn't statistically significantly generalize better than our favorite one shot pruning without retraining. So lottery tickets does not generally hold for very large models at least in a certain range. Third, we also observe that different pruning methods in those large and complicated enough models seem to convert to a surprisingly similar layer-wise sparsity pattern distribution. Here, I'm mostly talking about the layer-wise sparsity ratio because I don't control layer-wise ratios. They just naturally convert to this layer 30% and the next layer 5 to 50% and next layer somewhat, okay? 
And they are converged sparsity ratio are surprisingly similar. So those are perhaps demonstrate some mystery slash promise of pruning. There might be some essential things distributed across layers, and you don't need a more expensive pruning method to reveal you because the simple ones perform roughly the same. So with that, I want to make my conclusion here today to avoid you taking the wrong course from me. <laughs> so now, Shushok, is it easy or hard? It's easier for easier tasks, harder for harder tasks. Smarter. <laughs> <laughs> So what we are concluding today, specifying our larger and larger pre-trained models is easier in one sense that expensive pruning, like a larger data we know, may no longer be necessary. Don't waste your GPU doing iterative retraining. <laughs> Magnitude heuristics seem to be unreasonably effective shortcuts. It, I, I don't understand why Magnitude works so well. It, it always works. And there, what is more interesting to me is, from a non-convex optimization perspective, I have never felt sparse projection problem to be this easily solved. <laughs> I just thought it. I'm by heart a sparse optimization person. I don't know when this happens. <laughs> but what we know is, if you pruning as a sparse, sparse of the sparse optimization problem to projection to an L1 or L0 ball, will you press it? If people in optimization know that L1 projection has no closed form the, the, the loop solution, you need to do that iteratively. Here, I'm basically telling you that just the rank some project down, you get the best projection. <laughs> okay? So I don't know why they are so easily separable, but there seems to be. However, in another sense, this task is also harder if you consider the challenges of the versatile downstream task. We, all, we, we are not, none of us is really surprised if I'm handling a more difficult downstream task, sparsity is more fragile. However, this is also an inevitable concern when we talk about pruning a pre-trained, even large language models, because they are supposed to generalize to downstream task without seeing them. They are supposed to be tested on variable of the unvariable, unvariable tasks. And they are supposed to not lose performance on anything seen or unseen before. This is a ridiculous high standard for performance itself. And this should be the same ridiculously high performance for evaluating sparsity or pruning. In that sense, compression is very hard. So, Especially now, if you want a model to be the same capable in multitasking, say when we display the Vikua model on MMLU, that means on 16 or 19 different tasks, their performance has to remain the same. This is not an image net test set thing, okay? And if I'm talking about the in-context learning or instruction tuning, though I'm talking about the generalizing even without a task defined, you need to generalize to any input. Uh, we find it very hard for in-context learning, by the way. <laughs> so that invites the more intricate evaluation question. Should we still trust test performance to define which is a good compression? And I think that's well, more principal tools such as information theory should come in. We should not rely on test set because it's becoming impossible. And uh, so I hope so far I'm not contradicting myself. And what I'm not concluding today, which is even more important. Okay, don't call me wrong. Number one, I never say that pruning is a solved problem in large language model. So, uh, excuse me, now it's 18 pages later. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So did I say pruning is a solved problem? No. Pruning just become an easier problem within a spe specific range we call essential sparsity range. What I'm telling you is there exists such a sweet point range where alien pruning is no better than the simplest pruning. I don't predict beyond that point, okay? That's first. And certainly it's a harder problem if you consider, as I said, infinite task in generalization. Second, did I say magnitude pruning is a world stable level best pruning? I didn't say that. Again, my prerequisite is it's as good as unpruned fence model within the essential sparsity range. We observe that a sophisticated pruning method, such as a hasten-based second order, may work better at a high sparsity range. As I demonstrated, sparse GPT compared to us. Okay, that's a hasten-based method. 
However, this may not be relevant if you really are religious about it. I cannot lose any performance from this because when I start to be better, I start to lose performance in the same time. And also in the more restrictive O of M sparsity, we see further close the performance gap between the two. Third, did I say all pruning method fail at SMC or downstream test? Well, you have no idea. When I publish this SMC test, I get tons of emails saying that <laughs> you didn't measure my algorithm right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we were pretty tro troubled by that moment. <laughs> so we disclaimer, we only tested the popular basic options. And we indeed find second order pruning survive longer on the challenging task before they start to drop performance. Okay, compared to first order, they can survive longer in, in reserve in reserve relatively good performance. You still see performance drop, so they just drop. Right, better way to say that is second order pruning will drop performance slower than first order than first order, method, but they still drop. And one last thing I want to make a hint here is. Besides the pruning method itself, we find that what matters more is how you train this model, how you pre-train this model. It is a model pre-trained in a sparsity friendly way. How you set the learning rate matters a lot. How you use decay matters a lot. And how you, when you start pruning, how, whether you do uniform layer-wise ratio between layers of sparsity matter, or you choose a more delicate sparsity ratio distribution also matters a lot. Devils are in the details. Okay, with that, I think I'm out of the time and I'm finishing my talk. Thank you for attending. And so, please uh, let us our uh, online audience ask your question first and then we come back to the room if anyone has a question. <laughs>